Good day ladies and gents, welcome to our next worked example as part of our Structural Fire Engineering uh, course postgraduate module at Stellenbosch University and this is now our Steel in Fire section. We're going to be looking at a worked example now of an unprotected and a protected steel column in fire. So to start off with the question, and well, just with going through these uh, calculations below, make sure you have a copy of the calculations that you can follow. Uh, we provide, normally I write out the answers, or well, write out the, the solutions, but this is a very long calc, so it's much easier just to have the written copy with you. And also this sort of type of calculation you won't really do by hand. This is specifically uh, something that Excel is great for and uh, otherwise um, some sort of software, um, some codes or scripts to do the calculations. But it becomes quite iterative getting to the temperature of an uh, item after a period of time. So to dive into our problem, for a UC2032346 grade S355JR steel column in the middle of a room, what temperature does it reach after 30 minute standard fire considering the steel to be unprotected and B, the steel to have 12 mole gypsum board box protection. So that's a box all the way around. Calculate the compressive capacity of the column if the effective length is 5 meters for case A, above with no protection and B with passive protection. For the latter, what would be the capacity if the effective length is halved as per the Euro code? And you will discuss that later. So firstly we've got our calculation, we've got our 30 minute fire that we're going to be working with and this is the given section. I've listed the properties of the section that we'll need there and then those are illustrated on the cross section on the right. We're given the density and the specific heat of the section. Now when it comes to the heat transfer calculations, first thing we'll need is Stefan Boltzmann constant, so I've just put that into my calcs. And in the calcs that follow, I'm going to be doing them using a free piece of software called SMath Studio, kind of like MathCAD, and it runs all the calcs and handles the units and everything in the background. And uh, you can use that, otherwise I said this is a great thing to do in Excel. Next piece of information we're going to need is our convective heat transfer. So that is shown here, HC. That is important in the earlier stages of the fire, uh, whereas radiation becomes dominant in the later stages of the fire. The va that value H subscript C does vary depending on what type of fire you're using. If you have a hydrocarbon or a parametric, you do have other values that you should employ. It's quite hard to accurately define that value in reality, but we've got a number of simple values. But once again, it doesn't make a huge difference even if you use a different one because of radiation governing. Our time step, we're going to use a five second time step as per the Eurocode guidelines. You could use a smaller one, but wouldn't really recommend going to anything bigger than that. A fire emissivity. Uh, of one of the fire and 0.8 of the material. You do see some um, guidelines saying 0.7, for instance, for steel. The, the, ver the guidelines do vary depending on what tests they are based on, what code you're looking at. But our overall emissivity is about 0.8. Now our heated perimeter, we first need this, and this is an incredibly important parameter when we're looking at our heated perimeter over area and our section factor. So heated perimeter, our full perimeter is all the way around the section. I've done a more detailed calculation, including these radii, these sort of corner radii there. So this would be four times the breadth, so that's top, breadth, breadth, and bottom. And then what we do is we also have our eight our heights, so the height both sides. But now we've got to take off the two um, widths of the web there. And then we also minus off eight times the radii. So that's just the horizontal distance and the vertical distance. We remove all of those. And then once we've removed those horizontal distance, we add on a the circumference of one circle because we end up with four quarters of a circle hence one circle hence we just add on a circumference 2 pi r and that gives us a total perimeter of 1.187 meters you can do a simpler calc for this with just the first terms and leaving out the rest you'll see guidelines vary slightly depending on it. it's not going to make a huge difference if you do or don't include the radii um, depending on how accurate you are, or how accurate you'd like to be, and 
to be perfectly honest, our input parameters of a standard fire is normally very approximate anyway. Um, but as, a, so I, as I mentioned, a simpler method excluding radii also possible. But you'll often see the pre-tabulated very um, the tabulated values, the tables that you can pull section factors from should be calculated as I've shown here. Now if we have board protection, we have a rectangular box out, so we need this for our section factor and our, I mean our shadow factor. That is just a section all the way around. So there is our shadow factor all the way around and that gives us the HV value that box out and that's right up against the steel. And so we get, once we've got those, we can get our heated perimeter over um, area, HP of A. And this typically equals our section factor, otherwise referred to as F over V. And there are other ways that people refer to it in the different codes. Uh, HP over A is for cross section, where F over V is for a length of steel. But it, these will be the same for a constant cross section. They will not be the same if you have a, for instance, a cellular beam or a tapered beam or something that varies with cross section. Then uh, HP over A and F over V won't be the same. But once we've got that value, the 201.9 per meter is not a very uh, easy value to look at and understand. But if you convert it, you just take the inverse of that, you end up with a value of almost 5 millimeters. And you can think of that as effective thickness. That's saying this column, the heat roughly has to penetrate about 5 millimeters from every surface. So you could think of then five mils from the one direction, five mils from the other. So it's kind of saying on average the plate is sort of 10 mils thick and it's heat from both sides or five mils thick and heat from one side. And it's a more useful way to understand the um, HP over A value. Once we've got those, we can work out our correction factor as shown here to account for the, um, the, the shadowing of the, the flange because you've got fire below and then different parts of the steelwork sh provide shadows to the rest of it. Once we get that, now the next thing we're going to need is our temperature and that's our standard fire temperature as shown at the bottom here. With that, we can see what would our fire temperature at the end of 30 minutes and that's 842 degrees Celsius. And we're going to see now how much has the steel obtained of that. Our steel at the start, ambient is 20, and we're going to do the first step of the calculation at five seconds. So the, the time equals zero second has no result because the fire hasn't heated up. But we're going to do that the time equals five seconds, that, that increment there, and see how much does it heat up during that period. Once we've done that, so you can just double check the first step of your, your calculations, then the rest will be automated with a for loop. So <clears throat> the temperature of our fire after 5 seconds is either 369.7 Kelvin or 96.6 uh, degrees Celsius. They are basically the, the same, well they are the same thing, just one in Celsius, one in Kelvin. So the change in temperature of our steel is given as so, and we find out that it is 0.32 degrees Kelvin or degrees Celsius, but you'll see, I'll just discuss it just now, why I'm, I'm outputting values in Kelvin for a change. And with this calculation, there are two specific components to it. The first part is a convection, um, or it's convective heat transfer. That, the, our coefficient of convective heat transfer, and the difference between our uh, gas temperature of the fire and then our steel temperature. Whereas the second part is our radiative. So this is convective, this is radiative. And initially the, rate, the convective governs, but then for most of the calculations, the later calculations, the radiation becomes far more dominant. And so here it's the power of 4. So make sure these are all temperatures in Kelvin. The software I'm using works in Kelvin, so it's fine. But if you're working in Excel, make sure you add on 273.15 Kelvin to anything in degrees Celsius. Otherwise, you will find an error creeping in. And uh, yeah, that becomes a problem. So as I said, we've got our convective radiative heat transfer into So that gives us a total heat flux inside the brackets and then multiply it out to account for the section and how much of that energy is absorbed and we find it's 0.32 degrees Celsius in that first step. So that's our temperature at the end of the, well, at the start of T equals 5, and then during that next 5-second step, that's how much it heats up. Hence, at the end of the 5-second step, 
the steel has increased to uh, 0.32 degrees Celsius. I'm going to automate the rest of the process now. So there's going to be 360 steps. So just the number of the, the total tie, fire time divided by the change in well, the, the, the step time. So that's 360 steps we've got to go through. On to the next page. Our start time is zero and I'm going to run a loop. And so you'll see for I equals one to number of steps, calculate the change in steel temperature, update our steel temperature, increase the, the time, and then run that loop until the loop is finished. And if you do that, you'll find your temperature of steel is 828 degrees Celsius. But one thing we did in that equation, we assumed that the specific heat was constant. And just to remind you, the specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise one degree, one kilogram of material by one degree Kelvin or one degree Celsius. And so we can also specify a variable specific heat value. And I'm going to do that because the Eurocode does provide guidelines for a temperature variable specific heat. So here it is below. There's a little script that calculates it for below 600, below 735, below 900, and then above 900. Those are the specific heats. And you could put this in with nested loops in Excel or program it in a script depending on what you're using. One thing just to notice, just going to quickly diverge in the, the, the section, because I just want to explain something depending on what software you are using. The script above calculates specific heat at different temperatures. Since the software used SMath Studio works in Kelvin, great care must be taken with units, and the same may occur in other scientific software. So the details below are provided to make you aware of this, as care is required with Kelvin and degrees Celsius conversions. Consider, for example, so I put into my software 20 degrees Celsius divided by 1 degree Celsius, and it gives me an answer of 1.069. We would probably expect the answer to be 20 and to be unitless, but remember, if you work in degrees Celsius, but your software is actually in the background working in Kelvin, it's doing a different calculation. If we take 20 degrees in Celsius, but now convert it to Kelvin, and 1 degree in Kelvin, you have 293.15 divided by 274.15. Suddenly the answer makes a lot more sense. It gives an identical answer, but it looks very different. So just be careful when you're converting Kelvin and Celsius in software, and what is it is it telling you? In calculations, the difference between two temperatures in Celsius or Kelvin will give you the same answer because differences are fine. But as soon as you've got magnitude, so you're dividing or multiplying by anything in Kelvin or Celsius, you may end up with a problem. So just be very careful when you're doing that. But coming back to the equations, we're going to do the same thing again, have the t equals five second step and calculate the step, but now with a variable specific heat. Exact same equation as before. Now we find the temperature change is a little bit different during the first step, and uh, we continue. And if once again I automate that and I just iterate through for 360 steps, I'll find out at the end of that time my steel temperature is 809 degrees Celsius. Meaning, if I use a, uh, a specific heat that varies with temperature actually end up with a slightly lower temperature. It absorbs more energy, especially during the phase change se um, section of the graph. And the phase change is that bit there. You suddenly find a bit of a bump in your, your raise in temperature graph as the um, gas temperature rises, but your, your unprotected steel doesn't rise in the same way. Or your, well, just your steel in general. It's between about 735, around there, that this happens. So, what you can see, we've got two different results. Either are acceptable, I suppose, and I've plotted them in the graph. So the blue graph shows the gas temperature, the standard fire, and then the orange graph, my unprotected temperature. And you'll see it very rapidly towards the end catches the um, gas temperature. So it's it's very hot. You'd expect it to fail at those sort of temperatures. The, the strength has dropped to 10% of its original uh, capacity. But after this calc, we're now going to do the calc with 12 mils of gypsum board added. And you'll see there's a huge drop now that happens from the unprotected to the protected. But what's also very important, as much as it's half the temperature, well, from 800 to 400 degrees Celsius, it's, it's a significant amount higher in terms of yield strength, which we'll soon see. So continuing on, 
Hence, the final value ranges between 828 and 809 degrees Celsius. This shows that it's typically conservative and much easier to use the fixed value for specific heat. Hence, in this course, if you're doing this, uh, our structure fire engineering postgrad course, you can simply use the simplified constant value for specific heat, unless specified otherwise. But now, moving on, what happens if we add on a 12 mil board? Because we, for instance, we're in a design office, we did the calc above, we find our column fails, and now we need to drop the temperature until the capacity is high enough. For instance, we estimate initially that 12 mils may be enough, and we would possibly require a couple of iterations to get this right. But for the addition of a 12 mil gypsum box protection, the properties of the board from uh, Buchanan uh, as shown. So there are our properties of density, thickness, specific heat, and the conductivity. And so f according to the Eurocode again, the change in temperature for an insulated member is as according to that equation. And I've put in F over V, but once again, F over V is simply our HPB, our protected boxed out section over A for the section, because now we've got a box. And um, <clears throat> we're going to do the same thing now, applying that equation at the five second time step. So once the fire's just started heating up and then seeing what temperature increase we get. We do need this um, factor called phi. Phi accounts for both the steel properties, the insulation properties, and the section factor. And putting it all together, it influences then the rate of temperature rise uh, in our section. Just as a, a quick comment or something to quickly check is, uh, once again, sorry, this is our temperature at five seconds. In that equation, just be careful. The change in fire temperature is the change in the gas temperature over the um, it, uh, increment being considered. So for instance, at our five second increment, it's that temperature minus the temperature at zero seconds. So <clears throat> you do need to make sure that's not a delta T. It's very easy to confuse those terms. The left hand one is our time step. The right hand one is the change in fire temperature during the same period. Now coming back, we get that after that first increment at uh, we've used our change in temperatures minus 3.6 Kelvin which is a problem because that actually means the steel is getting cooler as the fire is heating up that's just sort of a numerical problem and our value can never be below zero so if it is we simply set it to zero anyway so hence there's no increase due to the influence of the material we set it to zero and we should have some sort of uh, if or maximum uh, script just to double check. So that's what I've done below. I've said use the maximum of zero, so anything below zero won't count, or the temperature increase as above. So the change in steel is due to the maximum of zero and the calculation above. And then we loop through, get carry out our 360 uh, steps, update the steel temperature the whole time. And if we do that, at the end of it, we find our steel temperature is about 376, which is a significant drop. That's a big drop relative to what we had above in terms of capacity, which you will see now. Because now we're going to continue on to how do we actually design and calculate the capacity of the steel column. We're going to be using the CSA, the Canadian Standards uh, S16, to do the calcs. And that is simply because the South African code, SANS 10162 Part 1, are based upon those codes for steel design. And the compressive resistance of a column is given by the equation shown there. If you're familiar with steel design, this will be very simple, the parts that follow. If you haven't been exposed to steel design before, then the next bits might you might get a bit lost in depending on, on how much you know. But the way to understand these equations is simply that you've got an area times a yield strength, so that gives you a force, and then an initial term which quantifies buckling. So if you've got a short column, there's very little buckling, so that whole term is almost one. And if you've got a long column, then it buckles very easily, and then that term gets closer and closer towards zero. So you've got a area times stress, and then a buckling term to account for. And that's based upon a non-dimensional slenderness to account for length, yield strength, and uh, Young's modulus as shown below. And we've got two empirical factors. This factor, the D equals 0 0.6, that's different. You don't normally see that with ambient temperature design. And also at ambient temperature, we normally have a phi factor, partial factor in front, 
at fire limit state, we have a one factor of safety on materials. So therefore it disappears. It, it is there, it's just set as one, so you don't see it. Our fact, effective length is, is five meters. We're given the sectional properties of our section. And as per the last worked example we did, just remember when you've got a, a section and it's gonna go, and it's gonna buckle, it'll buckle about the weakest axis. And we find that that is the y-axis typically for a section. The y-axis is normally the weaker axis. And you can check that. You just look at the R values. The R values, the lower the R, the more likely it is to buckle. And so here the R, Y, yes, it definitely is weaker. And so that will govern our behavior. And then our steel properties are listed. And if we use the 828 degrees Celsius calculated earlier, we could use the 808. It would just give us a slightly um, higher uh, capacity. We first need our yield strength and our updated Young's modulus value. So all I've done is I've taken the 828 degrees Celsius and interpolated between 800 and 900 degrees for our reduction factor for yield and our reduction factor for Young's modulus. And you can see our final answers are less than 0.1, i.e. we've got less than 10% of the capacity left over. So we've got a very weak column now at 828 degrees Celsius. So continuing on, you can see our, we've got 34 MPA. We started at 355 and we've got 16.8 GPA of uh, stiffness of Young's modulus and that started at 200. Plugging those values in the calcs above, there's our non-dimensional slenderness. There is our final compressive resistance. And you'll see below our ambient compressive resistance is above 800. So our column has gone from 800 to almost 60 because of the temperature increase. Now let's take the uh, protected column, same calc, identical procedure. All we do is we just update the properties with the 375 degrees Celsius. We have an updated yield factor, which means it's actually below 400. There's no loss of strength. We have our updated Young's modulus. We've lost about 28% of Young's modulus and we get our updated values. Plugging those in, we end up with a compressive resistance of 532. So you can see this is a lot more than above. So just to go through the comments at the bottom, the ambient temperature resistance of this column is about 812 kilonewtons. Hence the capacity has decreased, but in the second case, with the load at the fire limit state also decreasing, the probably will, will probably now be sufficient, just to clarify what I mean, with gypsum. Uh, 12 moles. The capacity is increased by more than nine times through the addition of the gypsum boards. The unprotected column will fail. That is, it's very unlikely that at 10% of the capacity it will be sufficient unless it's a very, very lightly loaded column. But here now with 532 kilonewtons versus ambient of 812, there's, there's a good chance it will be sufficient. It would, you would have to check what the actual loads are. But one final calc we're going to go through. Um, well, just sorry. First, as a comment, note that more advanced analyses are possible, taking into account the moisture in the gypsum board, which would decrease the temperature further as energy is consumed, causing the water to evaporate. We haven't done that. We've used these sort of simpler guidelines. But um, if the effective length was to be halved, our effective length would now become two and a half. Our non-dimensional slenderness would change and our compressive resistance would change. Suddenly we've got a compressive resistance higher than even at ambient temperature. Hence the assumption above about effective length has a very significant effect on answers. However, it in reality is difficult to find and typically safe going with the original effective length, the longer effective length. And what am I referring to here? Normally what would happen if this is a cross section through our building, we would assume a column to fail like that. It would buckle in a sort of an S-shaped manner. But the Eurocode does have an allowance. Let's say we have a fire at one floor, but the floor above and the floor below are cooler. Those columns there and there become stiffer, meaning at the end it's held in place and you end up with a fixed, fixed column. So on the left, I'd have K as one, while on the right, I'd have K, the effective length, as half. We'd have a 
half effective length and that you can use to increase the capacity further. Some people do object to this because it's very difficult to know do you have fire on only one floors, do you have fire on multiple floors and will you get that effective length change. So typically it would be safer to not use that assumption, typically it would be safer just to assume one and go with the calcs, although some people do try to optimize further using such uh, adjustments to effective length, which are permitted in the Euro code. Okay, so that has taken us through the calculations today. So just a reminder, we first started off with a unprotected steel section. We ran through the process of updating the temperature until we got the final temperature about 808 or 828, depending if it's a variable or constant specific heat. And in this course, you can use a constant one unless told otherwise. And then we added some gypsum board and then it brought down the temperature quite a bit. Once we had the temperature, we could calculate the capacity. And here we've just run through the capacity calculations to see how strong is our steel column at these different temperatures. And then furthermore, you can consider adjusting the effective length, but would have to be careful with that. Okay, and that takes us to the end of today's worked example. Thank you very much.